Uh, Minister, do you feel the need for former Prime Minister Hawke to come back and explain your industrial relations policy in the election campaign? <coughs> do you welcome the suggestion of the ALP Federal President that Hazel Hawke should also be given a role? Should former Health Minister Graham Richardson be brought back to cover for Carmen Lawrence? Will you support bringing back Alan Griffiths to explain your policies in sandwich shops and small businesses? Do you envisage... Do, 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 do you... Do you... Order. Order. Those are my rights. Do you... Those are my rights. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, will you invite Ros Kelly to campaign for you in sporting clubs? And do you envisage a role for Jim Cairns and Judy Morosi in the campaign? Would it help your campaign to bring back the failed ministers Order. of the past who still compare favourably with your performance? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Industrial Relations. Yeah. And can I say, as far as I'm concerned, Gough Whitlam on unfair dismissals under the ILO conventions. And that's the wonderful thing about us. We stick together. And that's why we'll beat you next year. A short answer and a short debate. But they were waiting for the main event, the return to Parliament on Thursday of Mr Keating. First question from Mr Hard. Who's running things, you or your old mate? Why don't you let us all into the real situation and tell us what Bob Hawke's role over the next two or three months is going to be? Isn't, he, isn't his job really going to be to prop you up just as the Labor Party used him to prop up Bill Hayden in the failed 1980 election campaign? Bring back Bob. Bob the Honourable Prime Minister. Listen, give him an economic policy. When they've been falling over there like nine pins, you would think this was the last question they asked, Mr Speaker. I mean, I mean I've had to knock over two of them in this parliament. Now I'm on to me third. Now, now that, Mr Speaker, I reckon, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, I reckon that, Mr Speaker, dare I say I think that's something of a record. <laughs> Banging over two opposition leaders in one parliament and working on the third. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker, he uh, knows engraved, engraved down there deep in his psyche Order. is the Box Hill tax speech. And one of the reasons I'm over here, Mr Speaker, is the Box Hill tax speech and our success in destroying it. Uh, and the same in 1990. And the same in 1993. Uh, Mr Speaker, they know who did them the damage in 1987. Because one thing about the professionalism of public life, you know when you've been hurt and you know who's hurt you. And he knows who hurt him. Mr Speaker, who kept him over there? No, Mr Speaker. No, Mr Speaker. Member for Gippsland. The member Bob's for Gippsland. Uh, Mr. Order. Speaker, Order. Mr Speaker, he had the unexpected resurrection and he's done nothing with it. He had, he had, the, he had the opportunity, he had the opportunity, he, was, he put his name up uh, after the election and the party went for John Hewson. He put his name up again, uh, and uh, the party went for uh, Alexander Downer. And Mr Speaker, oh, he put his name up privately. We know he's always had his little flag up. Uh, and uh, then he came the third choice of the federal opposition, and you ask him to be the first choice of the nation. And Mr Speaker, one of the great pleasures I had in this parliament was with uh, Bob Hawke doing those things, opening the Australian economy up, uh, giving us the, comp the competitiveness we today enjoy, opening up the exchange markets, opening up the financial markets, all the things that this person Order. said he wanted to do but never had the courage of doing. Never the guts. Mr Speaker, and uh, he, can, he, can, he can sling off at uh, Bob Hawke, but no. Mr Speaker, I went to uh, a... Uh, uh, I went to a Commonwealth Ministers' Conference, uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting a week or so ago, and Nelson Mandela was there, very much as a consequence of the policies of this government, and had it been the policies of John Howard, he would not have been there. The member for Cowan. Mr Speaker, the financial sanctions, which were introduced by the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, in a very large part designed by Australia and carried through by Australia, were the final straw that broke the camel's back of apartheid in South Africa. You stood against every single measure. You stood against every single measure. And when, uh, and when Mr Mandela walked triumphantly, Mr Speaker, into that room, he wouldn't have been there had you had your way. 
That was fun for openers, but Mr Howard wanted to pin Mr Keating on the crucial question of industrial relations. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister, or sh should I say the Neville Chamberlain of industrial relations? <laughs> 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 Can I say, you know, I think you know, we should say the Prime Minister and we'll get to the question. Mm. Oh, are those on uh, my right? Uh, uh, the question is to the Prime Minister. Yeah, peace in our lunchtime, Mr Speaker. <laughs> um, but Mr, uh, Mr Speaker, could I, um, could I ask the Prime Minister, is it a fact, uh, is it a fact, I asked the Prime Minister, that he told the Labor caucus this week that he supported contracts in industrial relations? Uh, Mr Speaker, whereas at least with the trade unions, you know where they're coming from. They want the right to collectively bargain and they want the right to organise themselves with a safety net for those who can't avail themselves of an increase under the enterprise bargaining system. Now, Mr Speaker, that's the way we're seeing industrial relations develop and we're starting to see very strong productivity results from that enterprise bargaining system. And that's been one of the things, of course, which have kept the inflation rate down and yet seen real wages rise and seen profits rise. So higher productivity is being shared between profits and wages, but it's protecting the inflation rate, the way any sensible labour market should operate. But you're about something different altogether. You want to get people where they're just on their, on their own, their single selves, dealing with a company or an employer. And if they don't like what's offered to them, they can get out. That's the, that's the model you want. You want the American model. It's not improved the flexibility of the American economy. It's not added to its supply capacity whatsoever. And as a consequence of all this, all you've got is an army of working poor. And I, I gave the figures in the House recently, 75% of the increment of American wealth in the last decade went to the top 3% of the population. And that's the model you want. What you go around is you're telling people fibs. You're saying, oh, we'll give you a choice when you know the choice is the contract or the sack. That's the choice. And you can see it at Camelco, where you said, we'll pay you more to take the contract, but once we get you in the bin, you'll take what we give you. We'll give, pay you more to get the union out, but once you the bite from the Latrobe poison apple, be a you'll then regret it later. Although the findings of the Eastern Royal Commission were debated exhaustively in the Senate last week, when the House of Representatives began its final session this week, there was no way it was going to let the Senate have all the fun. My question without notice is to the Minister for Human Services and Health. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Human Services and Health. Speaker, my question without notice is directed to the Minister for Human Services and Health. On Tuesday, the opposition was ready to renew its attack, but this is what happened. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Human Services and Health. What, motiv what motivation was there for your former ALP colleagues to fabricate evidence against you? Order. The question is out of order. It does not go to the Minister's responsibilities. The opposition's indignation knew no limits. The Deputy Leader Peter Costello jumped to his feet and moved to dissent from the Speaker's ruling. Mr Speaker, uh, you have allowed every single one of those questions. You have given rulings making it in order for the Prime Minister to stand up and to berate in answer to questions a Royal Commissioner. What is it that's happened between yesterday and today uh, that, would bring you, that would bring you to uh, come to an entirely different attitude? I mean, surely, Mr Speaker, we won't be able to draw the conclusion that it suits the government's political convenience. You have not a leg to stand on. I mean, quite frankly, Mr Speaker, if you are to do the right thing, you would now ask me to take my seat and admit that you are wrong. Now, the Speaker can't defend himself in this situation, but the government can and did. The Opposition Tactics Committee, Mr Speaker, has made a silly mistake. You have not a leg to stand on. I mean, quite frankly, Mr Speaker, if you are to do the right thing, you would now ask me to take my seat and admit that you are wrong. Now, the Speaker can't defend himself in this situation, but the government can and did. The Opposition Tactics Committee, Mr Speaker, has made a silly mistake in the question that they put before you, from being careful in the past in the way in which they've asked questions about this, they have at least kept a fig leaf of connection with the Standing Order 142. Now, what was this question? This question said, can you explain the motives of uh, a set of members? What's your opinion of X, Y, Z? Full stop. Opinion. End of story. No, no remote effort. Order. Order. to make a connection between that and the, uh, and the issues that are matters of debate here.
Now, I can recollect when I happened to be a backbencher confronted with the issues of, uh, of uh, whether or not questions were relevant. I'd get up, I'd ask a question. Billy Sneddon, the Speaker of the day, would simply say, out of order. No explanation. Now, criticism went to you, for example, that uh, you uh, had uh, failed to give an appropriate explanation for your rule. I must inform the Honourable Member, and I thought he would have known this, you are not obliged to. But I can recollect at the time when I was ruled out of order on a number of occasions by Speaker Sned. I went to... Uh, uh, I didn't stand up in Parliament and grizzle my head off about whether or not Billy Sneddon was a fair speaker. I, uh, I went to the whip and said, How this order, uh, why order. did this outrageous old buzzard rule me out of order? And the response of the whip as to why that outrageous old buzzard had ruled me out of order is that I was. Of course, when it came to the vote, the government's superior numbers meant the dissent motion was defeated. The opposition then moved to censure Dr Lawrence. Opposition leader John Howard led the debate, pointedly flouting another standing order of the parliament that remarks directed at another person in the House are made through the Speaker. Mr Howard's remarks were directed straight at Dr Lawrence. And you know darn well, don't you, why several months ago you persistently refused to repeat in this House the denial of your involvement in the petition that you'd given to the National Press Club. Dr Lawrence's defence was, as we've observed, along familiar lines and the whole matter moved no further. Until the revelation on Wednesday that WA Labor leader Jim McGuinty had told Prime Minister Keating some time before the Royal Commission began that Dr Lawrence's former Cabinet colleagues would contradict her account of the tabling of the Eastern Petition. On Thursday, Mr Howard tackled Mr Keating on that point. Why, Prime Minister, did you tell the House on the 3rd of August that you had full confidence in your Minister for Health when you knew that she was not telling the truth about the facts of the Eastern matter? Why, why did you conceal order, the fact that order. Jim McGuinty had told you six months ago that Carmen Lawrence's recollection was wrong? And furthermore, isn't it a fact that you went even further and you told McGuinty to get behind Dr Lawrence even after he told you that she was wrong? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, unlike the Leader of the Opposition who couldn't remember clearly his conversations with Mr Court, I remember clearly my conversations yeah, with Mr McGuinty. Uh, uh, Order! Um, Mr, 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 Speaker, Mr, McGinty did, Mr McGinty did not tell me anything I'd not already been told by Dr Lawrence. And that was... Order. The Prime Minister has the call and will be heard. Mr Speaker, uh, Member for Mr Heimarch. McGinty told me that uh, he and a number of uh, ministers would go into any proposed commission and testify against Dr Lawrence. Dr Lawrence had already told me that's exactly what they had told her. So there was no surprise that they would, uh, that they would do that. The Prime Minister. Um, by Dr Lawrence, and that is there would be differing recollections <laughs> uh, of, uh, of this... Uh... Order those on my left! Nothing told to me by Mr McGuinty alters in any way my view about the motivations behind the establishment of the Royal Commission or its conduct or its findings. I think, thought and think the Royal Commission was a disgraceful exercise, exactly. an abuse of executive government. And Mr Speaker, let me just quote from uh, Garfield Barwick's book, A Radical Tory, and see what he, uh, a, a highly esteemed member of the Liberal Party and supporter, he said, I find it remarkable that the public accept the conduct of royal commissions as a means of obtaining evidence, bearing in mind that our forebears revolted against the Star Chamber, which was a standing royal commission of its day. Press and politicians alike seem quite anxious to call for royal commissions in all manner of activities, not pausing to consider that the powers of a royal commission are easily abused. Indeed, the public exactly. spectacle of witnesses squirming under questioning by the Commissioner or by his assisting counsel provides dramatic copy for the daily press to the delectation of many of its readers. Exactly. Now, here we are. What an apt description of yeah. this, uh, of this putrid commission in Western Australia. After a long and particularly windy question time, Mr Howard moved a censure motion against the Prime Minister for almost anything he could think of. But the Prime Minister refused to accommodate him. Mr. Oh, Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I ask Leader of the House to move a censure of the Prime Minister. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's leave granted. 
Leave us well, not I, I, move, on I, I Oh! Stick it on Monday. No, I'll Monday do it morning. on Monday. No. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I move, I move that so much of the standing and section of the water is being suspended. I move, I move. You sit down. 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 You The Prime Minister will relax. Come back on Monday, he said, and walked out of the chamber. Well, I say to the Prime Minister, when the election comes, Paul, you won't be able to walk out of the great debate. You won't be able, to walk, be able to walk out of the great debate. I'll eyeball you in both of those debates. And if you like the political coward you are, walk out on those. The Australian people will have a good look at you.